What, so far, as you've gotten to know Queens and the work inside Queens, what has exceeded your expectations? Something that you thought was the case and your eyes wide open, but it's even greater than what you expected. So that's actually very easy. I've been a nurse for 40 years, in, and I've worked in several different communities, and I've always believed that the focus on quality, safety, and compassionate care is critical. Uh, and most of the organizations I've been in have been very focused on compassionate care. I can say from the depth of my heart, and I've spent a lot of time now listening to our caregivers, shadowing, I have never seen such a level of compassion. Uh, it is no question that both within the walls, whether it's our clinics or our hospitals, our home health agency, or whether I think it's in the community, the level of connection, the love, the kindness, uh, it is in people's soul, and it's a strong driver for the work they're doing. Uh, and for me, it's just inspiring. You've been at Intermountain Healthcare, mission-driven mm -hmm. organ mission organization in Salt Lake City, at Peace Health, also a mission-driven organization, out at an organization called Mission Health, a mission-driven organization. Uh, how do you sort of, um, place the Queen's experience, also a mission-driven organization, within the spectrum of your, you know, your mission-driven career? I mean, it's, uh, uh, how does it stand out vis-a-vis -vis these other experiences? So the thing that is similar, whether it was working in Utah with IHC or whether it was Peace Health in Oregon or in the mission, uh, mission health system is actually in the western part of the Appalachians, so it's the heart of the Appalachians. The thing that was very similar is they were all focused on quality and safety and uh, compassionate care, and they were all focused on communities that were both rural as well as urban. So there's uniqueness when we start to think about meeting the needs of everyone in the state of Hawaii. Uh, we have a large percentage of folks that are here on one island, and then we have lots of small communities that still need access. So what was similar with Queens as well as Mission in particular, Mission Health in particular, is the need to think very creatively about how we deliver care and assuring that that access and that quality is available in communities that may be 1,000 people versus a community that has seven or 800,000 people. So those pieces are um, similar, the issues are similar. What is different here in terms of the social determinants, because the social determinants, and I, Mark said it beautifully and, and so did Lara, if we're not addressing the broader issues of health, we are gonna be able to improve the health of our population, which I think everybody in this room is dedicated to do. Uh, here, the level of homelessness uh, is staggering to me, and it gives me great pain um, when, I, when I've been starting to understand it. And right now we serve about 70% of the homeless individuals are coming through our emergency room. Uh, we have to address that. If you do not have a home, if you are worried about not being in a safe environment, how can you have help? Uh, the other things that are uh, consistent are the needs that we have great opportunities. We have great opportunities to actually think about how can we partner within businesses to help address some of those social needs. So I'm very much looking forward to, and I've already seen it, what is different here in Hawaii than I saw in all the other states that I've been in is, while lots of folks talk about it's hard to bridge the gap between government and health systems and private business, from the first day I was here, I was seeing evidence that that's already happened and happening. Uh, one of the first en entities that reached out to me was HMSA, saying, we want to partner and think about care differently. Uh, and then we had our Lieutenant Governor Josh Green reaching out and saying, we've got to focus on hope hom homelessness, and we are focusing on the H4 project or whether we've had Lieutenant, our Lieutenant Governor, who's gonna to speak to us this afternoon, reach out and say, we've got a crisis in Samoa, can we address it immediately? What, what I see is we're unique. We actually have the opportunity to do things that most communities can't. 
there is a deep connection to our families. There is a deep connection to the community. So I see this as an inspiring time and a transformative time where we actually have a fighting chance to not only, the, the numbers say today we're the healthy, one of the healthiest states, but when you go behind those numbers and you start to look at uh, populations in different communities, we have great levels of pain and suffering that need to be addressed. I think we're actually in a position to come together and, and address those issues. Yeah. I know sometimes it's, uh, as you said, sometimes we use the talking points of collaboration or cooperation, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes they use, those are not quite as real as we might think in the talking points. Uh, but here it's different. And how would you characterize the plan provider relationships here in Hawaii vis-a-vis -vis plan provider relationships in other markets that you served? So you shouldn't quote me again, but in reality, I have said to several folks, our relationship with, and I'll use HMSA, they're a benevolent insurer. They actually do care about the people they're serving, and every interaction I've had with them, well, they have accountability, there's no question, and we all have accountability to reducing total cost. Every conversation I've had with them has been, how can we help you do that so that as a community we can actually see our communities thrive? So they are helpful in terms of thinking about how do you transform care. Um, a lot of places, it starts out with a very adversarial relationship between insurers and, and providers. Uh, it feels like there's arguments going on. What I've seen here is the opportunity to actually think about how we do it differently, and then I see them investing in how we do it differently. So I consider that a unique, um, and you have all experienced it. You may be used to it. Coming from a state, the states where that's not there, it is noticeably different, and I think it's one of the reasons we have the opportunity to truly decrease the total cost of care while having more people have access to care. One of the subtleties in, in Hawaii's healthcare system is really just the difference between Oahu and the other neighboring islands mm -hmm. across the board of topics and issues. Uh, Queens has you know, had a really strong impact on the success of healthcare in neighboring islands, despite it being, of course, headquartered here on Oahu. Uh, what have you learned about the neighboring islands and Queen's unique role there uh, in the first three months of being here? So I believe one of the first things that are most important to any leader is to listen and understand. So still, I'll put this in context of I've only been here three months and there's still a lot of conversations and learning for me. Uh, but I went very early to Molokai and spent some time on Molokai. Uh, and then I've been at our North Community Hospital in, on the Big Island. What was really important to see and to feel is, and let's use Molokai, a very small community. If they don't have a critical access hospital and a rural health, um, health clinic, there's a population that don't have access to the critically important primary care that is needed. They don't have access to the emergent care. What's exciting to me, and I think later one of our, our clinicians, Dr., uh, Dr. Koenig, is going to talk about telemedicine. What we do know between urban environments and rural healthcare is if we design it effectively and we have telemedicine available and we base our rural care in strong primary care uh, and some good technology, we usually can bridge that gap quite effectively. So what I saw, and here was a story, and I'll, I'll share this story with you. Uh, last week we were celebrating Queen Emma's uh, birthday, her, and, her 160th birthday. Uh, and when you think about what she did and how she, her creativity and her commitment, and she was very young, she was in her 20s when she did all this, it was inspiring to me. Well, at the end of that conversation, there was a woman in the audience that came up to me and said, Jill, I need to tell you a story. And she had walked through one of our, she had come to one of our, uh, our EDs, our emergency departments. She had had her stroke two months earlier, eight weeks before this date. And she said, because there was telemedicine, 
She said, I was seen by the emergency doc who was talking to the neurologist and the neurointensivist, and I got that life-saving treatment in less than 10 minutes. And then she looked at me and said, and, and I'm here today, I'm walking to a meeting because I could. That's, the, that's what I see in terms of the, the care that can happen. And I believe that all of us here that have more resources on Oahu have an obligation to make sure that our sister programs across the state are, are getting their needs met, particularly in terms of our primary care providers. And I think there's lots of, of creative ways that we can address that. So uh, a lot of times CEOs will have offices that uh, send a message uh, you know, about their leadership style or maybe there's nothing in the office because they're an operator and they're bouncing around and they, you know, they're only here for uh, one moment. What kind of office do you have? Is it Spartan or is it uh, decorated? And if it's decorated, what do you have up on the walls that we should know about? Oh, fabulous question. Um, so the first thing I did with our, my office is I took out a fair amount of it and put in a conference table because all of our offices should be convening for groups and we should be working together and having dialogue. So it was very important to me that it was a place to convene, it was a place to think together, and it was always, it's never done by one individual, it's always done by a team. Uh, the second thing that was really important to me was, I have this beautiful picture of my mama and my auntie, who were both nurses, both became nurses uh, through the GI Bill. They um, were, were never had to serve in World War II because they graduated in 1945. And their picture um, is a symbol to me of dedication, service, um, a love of the people you serve. So that has to always be in my office and something I see. And then there's the picture of Queen Emma, who I think just is a symbol for all of us of a tireless leader who loved the people she served and did incredibly innovative and creative things to meet them. How much do you, do you feel this sense of like you are the torchbearer for this legacy? Like you're also a hospital operator, you gotta do all that stuff and you know, but you're also part of this thing that will well outlive you. So um, I always believe, and in the, the three health systems that I've been in now the fourth, uh, there's always been strong leaders, usually hundreds, you know, decades before me, that have created the honor to be where I'm at. So I do believe that there is a tremendous legacy and a spirit about the work that happens at Queens, and it's been going on for 160 years. I believe that that's really then a critical accountability. But I don't believe I'm the person in front. I, I believe the persons in front are the individuals that are directly working with our patients and our families. Mm -hmm. uh, it's our frontline caregivers. It's the environmental service technician that's keeping us safe by cleaning the, the hospital. So I believe that the, the legacy is making sure we keep serving our whole community, that we love each other, and we're gonna collaborate to do the creative, innovative things that make it better. Uh, and I feel very accountable that that legacy con continues and thrives. Uh, and I don't ever want to discount the innovation that has to happen because I believe our foundress was extraordinarily innovative. Yeah. Jill Hogarth Green, thank you, ma'am. CEO of Queens Health System, let's give her a round of applause. Great stuff.